Transferwise is a, is a new kind of financial institution. We're really kind of designed for the people who are, let's say, borderless and living their lives between multiple countries. So we started out uh, because of a personal frustration. So myself and my co-founder were both immigrants and we moved from Estonia to London. And as we had to move our money from Estonia to London, we realized how the banks are really screwing us, overcharging and under-delivering for a very simple service. And so we found a better way of doing it, kind of utilizing the peer-to-peer -peer principles of, you know, I was paying himself, him in, in Estonia and he paid me in London, and found a much better way of doing it. And then we realized there are hundreds of millions of people all around the world who would benefit from a service like that. So we launched it seven years ago, cutting the long story short, today there are more than a million people using TransferWise, removing a billion euros every month, and that's still the starting point. So the money actually never is sent from one country to another. It's kind of passed on between your customers within one country, is that...? Exactly. Okay. As okay. much as we can, we do that, and that helps us offer a faster, offer a faster service and charge less for it. Sure. Okay, uh, now to the real story here. Um, you still live in London, I gather, which is kind of surprising given what you've said before Brexit, or before the referendum. Yes, I still live in London. And London I mean, he said he said he's going to consider seriously moving his headquarters from London to Berlin or Paris. Correction, we've we've never we've never said that. We've said that okay. we will need to open up a European headquarters. Okay. And you know, if I was starting TransferWise today, then given the uncertainty that we still have and will probably have for a long time to come, I'm not sure I would choose London for it. So, okay. So, so if you had to decide today where to put. Uh, Transferwise, you wouldn't put it into London, even because, even if I mean, if there's the city, there's the big financial industry that that should be actually quite attractive for you guys, even with, with uh, I think Brexit. It, it would be a very hard choice today. But you know, if if you look at what's happening with Brexit, and you know, we've been in a period of uncertainty for now more than twelve months, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's very hard to see when this will become anything anything certain. And you know, if you if you put that in the context of, uh, of fintech then uh, there are two things, you know, one is regulation. So Europe today has a fantastic regime of uh, what's called passporting. So we could regulate it by one regulator. For us, it's FCA in the UK, who, by the way, is the best fin fintech regulator in the world. And then you can use that license uh, to serve customers, to serve 500 million customers all over Europe. Let's compare that to US, where we have a state-by-state -state license, which is a total pain in the backside. And then that kind of one is regulation. And if UK leaves Europe, then you know it's safe to assume that uh, in the long term you probably don't want to be regulated uh, by by a regulator who's inside Europe. And the second one is talent. So I'm an immigrant myself. Uh, you know, in the worst case, I need to leave UK. But you know, more kind of pragmatically, we're seeing already today that uh, you know, for people who are coming to UK, has much less buzz around us than it was 14 months ago. You know, we have the people in our London office uh, are not British born, and and, we're con and you know in order to continue innovating, to continue to continue growing tech companies, we all need talent. And if it becomes harder to get talent to come to UK, then the UK is going to lose out. Have you already applied for your permanent residency? I have not. You have not. So you maybe, have, maybe are you a risk taker? So you're a risk taker. Maybe. You know, I kind of think about it in a way that uh, if it really becomes so bad, if it really becomes so bad that I can't live in the UK, then it might be time to leave. Cool. So what, but uh, within TransferWise, what have you done since the referendum? I mean, what, what, in anticipation of, I mean, let, let's assume Brexit, uh, there's no exit to Brexit, from Brexit. Uh, what have you done? So we're, uh, what we're doing is we're figuring out where, where would we open up our European headquarters. Yeah. So, you know, luckily, we have an office in Estonia already, which has a, a good regulator. We have an office in Hungary. So we're kind of looking at, okay, Estonia, Hungary, and a couple other places in Europe. Where would it make sense to set up another office, which would become our European headquarters, which we would use to become regulated in Europe? So we're still choosing that, you know. Luckily, there's still a bit of time, so it's not the most important task for us, but it's something that we need to, we need to get done with. What's the short list? We haven't disclosed it. You know, it's. I would say it's the kind of the, the usual ones you would guess. Okay. Now, so what I guess a good thing is there is choice. 
And you know, for us, I guess you know, where it gets more complicated is you want to, you know, if we think about it, we'd like to open a new office and we'd like to be able to hire developers in that country, think about what other functions we can have. So, you know, it's about uh, regulator, it's about the overall environment for doing business, it's about talent, kind of all of these things combined. Mm. Have you ever put a number on what Brexit will cost you? We have not. Yeah. Um, and for us, it's, I think it's pretty simple. We're still incredibly fast growing, so we're doubling our our turnover on a, on a yearly basis. We are already regulated by 39 regulators, or sorry, actually a bit more. You know, adding one regulator and adding an 11th office to 10 we have already, it's kind of, you know, at this point it's a natural course of business for us, so, you know, spending time to figure out how much it costs, it, you know, doesn't, it wouldn't change our, change our mind anyway, so why waste time on it? Okay. Now, if you were uh, Theresa May's advisor on startups, uh, kind of for Tech City London, wh what would you tell her? What kind of what can she do to soften the blow of Brexit for for the ecosystem in London? Don't do it. <laughs> um, it's hard. I mean, you know, kind of on the very basis of it, uncertainty is not good for any business, whether it's startups or or mature companies, and we are in a period of uncertainty, and you know the pendulum kind of keeps swinging, which you know, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, the pendulum swing would, be, swing would become smaller and smaller. It seems that the reverse is happening. You know, we have another big blow here and there, kind of every every other week. You know, yes, I would tell her, you know, figure it out, but it's probably it's also kind of hard to hard to expect. Um, the more pragmatic things, I think, would have to do with talent. I think kind of uh, coming up with a stance for talent, I think could be a, a pretty big milestone. And do that early kind of Yes, signal. to do it early, so kind of, you know, encouragement for everyone who's today in the UK and people who would be coming through in the future. And hey, you know, we're still gonna be open for talent, you know, here, you know, sure, you probably need to dress it up somehow with some limitation, but you know, let's kind of figure that out quickly and let's make it public and let's fight for getting that agreed with Europe then. Okay, ch change of gears. I mean, we, we probably could talk at length about European ecosystems and whether Paris is better than Berlin or Stockholm or, or Tallinn. And, and, and I mean, a press conference, uh, tech conference are full of those panels. I, I don't think that that's very interesting. What I was a bit surprised from take home from this, uh, this morning is kind of almost a I would say a protectionist, nationalist mood, let's defend the European tech industry, which I'm, I'm a bit surprised about. But I mean, I've, I've read something you've, read, you've written recently uh, uh, on Medium, but you have a different approach, it seems to me. It's, it's, you, you said, okay, we can have regulation to constrain uh, uh, business activity, but we can also have regulation to, to create or enable or, or make business activity easier. Could, could, could you kind of elaborate on that? True. I mean, you know, kind of in the end, I think still it's, uh, it's not the policy which creates rocket ships, it's yeah. people that create rocket ships. Yeah. But, you know, uh, thinking about what, is, what are the right policies to, to create an environment which is uh, most supportive for innovation, most supportive for, for startup companies, I think that's something which is well worth thinking about. You know, we do think about this every day in the context of transferwise and, and financial services, you know. A lot of, lots of things when it comes to, like, anti-money laundering, know your customer, where, you know, it's just uh, thinking about how do you design an environment where the newcomers uh, are not held back by regulation which is designed for incumbents. Let me give you an example from Singapore. So we launched uh, in Singapore uh, a while ago, and what we had to do in Singapore is we had to open up a physical kiosk for customers to come in and show, uh, show their passport to use TransferWise. Something we'd never had to do anywhere before. And obviously, this is, this is purely because of banks. You know, banks have a branch network, or everyone is already a customer of a bank, so it's in the interest of banks not to do online KYC. But then, luckily, you know, Singapore is quite forward-looking, and so regulators are is trying hard to catch up with UK regulator. And then we worked with a regulator, and we became one of the first companies to be allowed to do online customer identification and we were the first one to launch a fully online service. But that's like as a great example of regulation which will make the playing ground much more even for everyone. I mean if you look with that idea in mind uh, an exa or example in mind, I mean if you look at Europe 
as as a startup, I mean, you're not no longer a young startup, but it, uh, you still kind of can be classified as a startup. Where are the biggest problems for you in terms of in Europe, in terms of kind of free free flow of let's say talent, information, data, and and and, and the sort? So the uh, so biggest problem I would bring up here on a very macro level is that we're still a collection of separate countries and separate laws. You know, if we try to hire somebody in Germany, it's very different from hiring people in Estonia or UK. You know, not talking about if we need to fire somebody in Germany or France. So, so kind of, you know, creating jobs, losing jobs, all of these things are so, they're very complicated. You know, you have, to, you have to go through a lot of local red tape. You know, so there is a lot of good, good things. You know, digital single market has lots of kind of great ideas behind it, you know. Not, not everything has been implemented yet. You know, and I think the, the overall movement goes in the right direction. Eh? But I think you know, where, where you meet people is where it's still most complicated. You know? Needing to hire an office space. You, know, you, you end up getting into local regulation for people, offices, a lot of these things, which I think for a young company are, again, hassles which are hard to overcome. And you know, for us now, with 700 people, it's it's okay. We don't we don't need to worry about it. But when you're ten, when you're a company of, of ten engineers in Estonia, and then you need to open up a sales office in Germany, that's completely new ground for you. That's difficult. Now, in your piece in, in Medium, you also mentioned data, free flow of data, which, of course, an issue. There was a communication on that here here in Brussels from from the Commission. I mean, to give us some concrete examples, what that means. I mean, is is the free flow of information impeded in in, in your case or? Is that not? Is that not an issue? So I think you know it's um, that's uh, something which is uh, coming from the great minds in Estonia, thinking about how we have e-residency and um, and all of these things. So you know you should think about your data as something that belongs to you, and and you can ask any company to export it. You can take it to a competitor. You know, if you get if you buy uh, a self-driving car from uh, from BMW, you know. You should be able to download all the data it has about you, and then you should be able to go to a, a nice French car and upload your data, and it would start behaving. You know, it would, it would immediately recognize what what other cars learned about you. Yeah. You know, I think parts of it might be might be complicated to achieve, but if you think about it as a long-term direction, you know, it it does make a lot of sense if we're thinking about the free movement of goods, you know, similarly your data should be able to move between companies, you know, maybe even, you know, you will create an industry of data brokers who are sitting in between, so, you know, I think it's, I don't, I, I can't imagine anything kind of coming to fruition within a year or two, but if, but it, as a long-term direction, I think it's, uh, it, it would enable a lot of exciting things. But how do you, I mean, there's this, this tension, kind of, there's this debate about we need to create almost property rights and data. I mean, we've argued for that, and, and, and per, exists kind of for personal data, but should also exist for, for corporate data. At the same time, uh, you want more freer flow of data, because all the kind of the AI stuff is about mixing data and, 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 and crunching it. Uh, seems to me there's a tension, but I mean, how, how do you solve that? A, kind of how you think about it and, and, and in your company? So uh, I think even... Uh, I would think a bigger, I think a confusion that still exists in the world is if you actually start thinking about business models of many kind of online companies, how Facebook or Google depend on depend on the information you as a user give them. So I, you know, maybe you know, even we need to zoom out and start thinking about that. So how do we how do we make sure that people understand what free means? You know, free usage of Google means. Google actually thrives on the information it learns about you every day, and and you have no control over that. You know, same thing for Facebook. You know, again, anything that is advertising based. And now, as we move into the world, the world powered by AI, where data has a much bigger importance. And there, I I don't have I don't have answers for that. I haven't haven't spent enough time thinking about it. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the digital single market program. Um, uh, I mean, which generally, I mean, it's very ambitious, uh, and not a lot of it has been implemented. Uh, seems to me, at least, but I may be wrong, that it's 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 a lot of stuff that helps incumbents rather than than startups. Would you say that that that's a fair assessment? I don't know. Um, I think I think it has the right intention. It has good intentions, but as often, I'm sure, in the process of 
good intentions becoming uh, written law in all in all member states, it gets influenced a lot more by incumbents than startups. And I think that's kind of the I think that's the overall problem with regulation. The way I see it, you know, regulators are not paid to be innovative. So regulators are typically, you know, their the role is to is to regulate where the markets don't. But they're oftentimes behind time. Often they're behind time. So it again, you know, might not be a bad thing, but they end up being influenced much more by incumbents and therefore favoring incumbents. And it's for very simple reasons. You know, if you're a, if you're a small ten person startup, you don't have the you don't have the manpower, you don't have the expertise, the contacts to go and talk to regulators. Plus. Regulatory cycles are way too long. You know, if you're building, if you're building a new company, it's pretty hard to to wait two, three, four years for change in regulation to happen, which will allow you to do the business. So you need to kind of act upon what's available today. So, you know, then I think it's probably inevitable that regulation is a little bit behind time. So maybe you know, you need to think about kind of create a new constituent, which you know, stands for entrepreneurship, innovation, and startups. Which is which will be consulted. You know, some way of making sure that that uh, needs of young, fast-growing companies who will have the jobs five or ten years from now, that's our, that's taken into account in the process. But is there you have an idea what 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 could be done? I mean, is it you guys getting together, kind of creating your own lobbying organization, or or is there anything else you 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 could make that that uh, kind of sausage making more more pro startup? So I think. I think there's an overall mood where entrepreneurship is becoming much more accepted. Many more people understand that lifelong employment, like you know, maybe even you have as an economist, you know, is not the choice for choice, or is not available for most people in the world. And many more people are thinking of entrepreneurship, and also maybe in certain cases it gives more flexibility to people. Uh, they're thinking of that as a, as a solution instead of going to work for a bank or a telecom. And I think as that kind of becomes more and more popular, I think that voice is, is going to become louder and will kind of find its place. You know. And whether the solution is, uh, is having industry lobby groups, uh, maybe, you know, maybe not the lobby group for entrepreneurs, but maybe it's a different one. So I think the solution will probably form, be different in different countries. And I think you know it's also something where the uh, leading companies, uh, you know, as as transferwise as well, just need to I think need to show the way. Yeah? You know, if if you look today, if you look at the big, uh, if you look at the big U.S. companies, you know, there are lobbying lobbying efforts are huge armies in Washington. Yeah? I think now it's a question of thinking how is the kind of the next level of companies are and how how they can do it. Okay. Now in an ideal world, what what could the EU do? I mean, could they create kind of a free trade zone for startups, companies to a certain size? Or what? I mean, if you if you had kind of if you were Juncker, and you had power, I don't know if Juncker has power, but uh, just let's assume he has. What would you do? I think making the EU truly behave like one market would be very powerful. So have. A, truly have a market of 500 people who can move themselves, where data can move, where you have none of, none of the things getting in the way that we, that we mentioned before. So I think that would be very powerful and you know, create one of the biggest markets in the world. You know, versus now we still have you know, different markets, UK, Germany, Estonia, and so on. So you know, truly having one market with one set of regulation uh, which is designed, keep, designed uh, keeping in mind the needs for young companies uh, would be very powerful. But uh, you know, but uh, sir, but besides regulation, I think there are other things we need to think about sir, as well. Like, like for example, uh, uh, what is uh, how is uh, how do people perceive failure? You know, kind of other aspects which are keeping us back. You know, you look at the. You look at U.S. and you and you have someone, uh, someone who on whose CV you see three failures, and you know you look at oh, that's an experienced person. You know, I'm going to offer him a job. Versus, if you look at a person in Europe who's got one failure on their CVs, and it's like, you know, no, not hiring. 
So kind of, you know, these perceptions mm. are very powerful. And, and I think, again, it will probably the best thing which helps is time. You know, having success stories, you know, so what the, it's a, it can't be told over and over again uh, in terms of how important Skype has been for Estonia. Having that one success story which shows that, uh, hey, you can build a world-changing company in a small place like Estonia. You know, it's a number of companies, including mine, which have kind of come after that in Estonia is huge. You know, similarly, we need these local success stories in every country because that will make entrepreneurship seem as a legitimate choice and, and that will help the next generation of companies come around. So to wrap this up, I'm going to allow you a bit more plugging of uh, TransferWise. Uh, but you, you just introduced something called Borderless, uh, which I found was rather intriguing. Uh, I'd like you to explain what it is, but it's, uh, it's kind of creating that market. So I wonder kind of... Yeah, so the, the Borderless account is very simple. Yeah. We're giving... Uh, so while previously you could only use TransferWise to move money from one country to another, now what we like to do is we like to keep a balance at TransferWise we we'll let you keep it in multiple currencies. So you can have a balance in pounds, in euros, in dollars, and we're giving you a local account number to access it. So, you know, for example, you could be a freelance journalist sitting in Bali, and you'll have an account number in UK, in Europe, and US to get paid. So you can act like a local company, you can keep that money in TransferWise account in multiple currencies, you know, which, and, and then, Shortly after, we're going to give you a debit card which you can use to access that money. So it's something which we've designed together with our customers, kind of listening to, to them, see how they're using banking products, what are the other pain points we can solve for them. So we see it as a, as a small step forward for money transfer, which is helping, helping our customers who are living increasingly borderless lives and letting them deal with money in a much more easy to use and fluid way. And, and that, is, that is completely transparent for me as a customer. So if, if I want to use my, let's say, pound, uh, pounds in, in the UK, in my UK account in Germany, I could kind of pull them over easily. Ab pay absolutely. Okay. And, and whenever you need, to, you need to change from pounds to euros, you'll, you'll get to do that using the transferwise exchange rate, which is typically going to be five to ten times cheaper than using your friendly neighborhood bank. Cool. We're, we're out of time. I think questions aren't allowed. Thanks a lot, David. Oh, it was very great, and let's do it again. Thanks a lot. Thank you.